Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, good morning everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Janis Kutis from uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, Janis is just wrapping up a postdoc with Gary Miller where they've been doing a lot of wonderful uh, work in large sparse linear system solving uh, using techniques they call combinatorial multigrid. And he's gonna be giving two talks today. Um, uh, the first one is about the, uh, the graph sparsification and the second one will be this afternoon at 3.30 on some of the more theoretical proofs. So welcome, Giannis. So thank you very much for having me. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, Gary Miller and Richard Pank. Uh, um, a few words uh, about our sponsors. Uh, uh, this uh, work was originally funded by the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center uh, and uh, more recently by the Center of Computational Thinking, which is a joint uh, center with Microsoft Research and Carnegie Mellon University. So our motivation uh, uh, is going to be very large uh, sparse linear system, AX equals B, where the dimension is N, and we have M non-zero entries in the matrix. So for this very large general class of, uh, of matrices, there's actually nothing, known, nothing better known than matrix inversion, which uh, basically uh, doesn't uh, do anything about the sparsity. Uh, mm -hmm. The, yes, it, it's a square matrix. So uh, it's a linear system which always has a solution. Uh, so um, after, um, after realizing that we don't know too much about this general case, we start restricting our problems. And uh, for example, looking at the symmetric positive definite case, uh, where the complexity is a little better, m times n. Uh, for planar positive definite matrices, the complexity is n to the 1.5. And that's a famous result by Lipton Rose at Tarjan. And that has recently extend, been extended to planar non singular matrices. Uh, uh, well, uh, these complexities are kind of high, though, for very large problems. Uh, so we have wonderful open problems uh, uh, here. Uh, what we're going to do is to uh, restrict our class of matrices even more. And we're going to care about, yes? Yes. Non-singular matrix, what does it mean to solve that system? Uh, it's exactly, non-singular means it doesn't have a null space. So uh, it has a full set of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, and it's symmetric. Uh, uh, so they just, previous yeah. result about, was about positive eigenvalues and now uh, including negative two. So we're going to restrict our matrices even more and talk about very large pass symmetric diagonal dominant systems. Don't worry about what that is yet. Where in Spearman and Tank in 2004 proved something very uh, strong that the general systems of this kind can be solved in time, which is linear times some polyloaded factors, where um, the number of lobes is huge, 25 or more. And they also proved that planar systems can be solved in time m log square of n. Now, in 2007, we proved that planar systems can be solved in linear time, which is optimal. Because when you solve the system, you at least have to read the memory uh, in, uh, in uh, the, the matrix in the memory, and that needs uh, m work, uh, linear work. And now in 2010, we proved actually that general systems can be solved in times in time m log square of n, improving the polylog factors in the spin one and tank solver. So uh, all these complexity results are up to lower er uh, lower order terms uh, factors and some error because those uh, are uh, iterative algorithms so you converge the solution, there's always some error. And there's some uh, probability of failure because the algorithms are randomized. But uh, we will ignore these things in the rest of the talk. So now the thinking in the computer science theory is that SDD systems are going to become a, a powerful algorithmic primitive. Uh, in, this, in the way we have today in our library, say, sorting algorithms, in the future, we'll have perhaps uh, STD linear system solvers. Uh, and I have to 
convince you uh, that uh, this is going to be a useful thing to have. Uh, let me try to do that. Um, so uh, we, have, we will start looking at Laplacians of weighted graphs as a special case of uh, an STD matrix. So we have our graph looking, for example, at the edge between 1 and 2. It has a weight of 20. And it becomes an entry in the matrix in the 1, 2 position with a negative sign. Uh, so we will do that for every edge. The matrices are symmetric, the Laplacians. They are negative of diagonals. Uh, and uh, the diagonal is adjusted so that the uh, row sums and the column sums are zero. All right. Now, to get the full class of general of uh, SED matrices, what we are going to do is we can just start by a Laplacian, flip some signs in uh, the off-diagonal entries, but always preserving symmetry, and also allow to add one positive diagonal matrix in the original matrix. So that forms the whole class. But we won't be worrying about general, general class at all. The reason is that there are very simple reductions of the full case to the Laplacian case. Uh, and that's known as uh, double cover. And it's due to uh, Keith Gremlin. Uh, one idea here is to split the matrix A to the diagonal the positive part and the negative part, and then set up a new system, the bigger one, where somehow we have uh, the positive entries going with a negative sign in the off-diagonal block. So by doing that, we just double the number of non-zeros in the matrix. But it can be shown that those two systems are essentially equivalent. And we can uh, recover the solution x by solving the second system. So we just reduce then our original system to something which has non-positive of diagonals. And there is also some very simple trick to uh, deal with an extra diagonal, positive diagonal in the symmetric diagonal domain case too. So then we just focus on Laplacians and graphs because they are corresponding one to one. Uh, uh, the reason that Laplacians and SED systems are very useful uh, is because there are a lot of connections with physics and nature. Uh, for example, uh, you can think of something which is called a random walk, where you have, imagine, a particle sitting on a node and starts walking around randomly according to the edges, uh, probability according to the edges of, uh, of the graph. So now there is a matrix that expresses this random walk, and uh, that has, uh, the matrix has an easy uh, expression, it's an easy expression of Laplacian, it's a function of Laplacian multiplied on the left by the diagonal of the Laplacian, inverted. Uh, you can also think of the graph as an electrical network, where now the, uh, the, uh, e the edges become wires, and the weight of each edge is the capacity of the wire. And Ohm's law, for example, can be ex expressed in terms of the Laplacian, L times V equals I, uh, where V is the set of voltages that you apply on the nodes, and I is the vector of residual currents on the nodes. And there are connections between those two things. For example, the commute time between two nodes, which is I start on a node, I do a random walk. What's the time I, uh, it takes, expected time it takes to visit another node and come back? That's the commute time. The, that commute time is proportional to the effective resistance. Um, so let's consider then a simple application in data mining where uh, you have a movie people database. The blue nodes here are movies. The green nodes are uh, people. And uh, each person has a number of uh, preferences. Okay? So what is a, recommendation, a good recommendation algorithm? And here's a proposed algorithm. So you expect that people with common taste in movies are connected with many short paths in the graph. Um, so uh, if I am connected uh, to another person, uh, or uh, me and a person with, simil uh, with similar taste, we will be connected by many paths, meaning that we can send a lot of electric flow between me and the other person. Uh, and that means that the effective resistance between me and another person, or a movie that the other person likes, is going to be smaller. Um, so then we can just let uh, L be the Laplacian of the graph, Isa by the ith vector of the uh, usual basis, 
for the, uh, for the space. And the effective resistance then between nodes i and j is given by, uh, by this formula. As you can see, uh, I have uh, the Laplacian inverted. This means the Moore Penrose pseudo inverse the plus, but it's basically the inverse of the Laplacian. So in order to compute the effective resistance between me and someone else, I have to solve a system. So the recommendation algorithm involves the solution of a linear system with a Laplacian. Now in uh, computer vision, uh, this is a scan of uh, a human eye. Uh, what you see is the layers of the retina. And um, you see a lot of noise in the picture because we, can, we cannot use high power uh, in order to avoid burning the eye. Uh, and the problem here that people uh, uh, care about is to segment, uh, segment out the retinal layers. And the segmentation you see here is something that's produced by heuristic that comes with the current hardware. Not very good. Now, what people in the uh, in vision community proposed is to model the image as a square grid, uh, where now the pixel become vertices. And that's known as the affinity graph. Uh, and uh, uh, the edge weights are proportional somehow, or depend on the uh, similarity of pixels. So when uh, two pixels are roughly the same, then you get a strong con connection. Uh, when they are dissimilar, you get a weak edge. And we now transform the problem to, finding, uh, to, to the old problem of finding a meaningful cut in the affinity graph. Uh, the question is, how do we define meaningful? So for weighted graphs, uh, uh, we will define the sparsest cut problem, where here you have, say, one cut, which has a total weight of uh, 21. Uh, if you look at the incident weight on the first part of the cut, it's 85, summing up all the weights there, sometimes by two. Uh, the part B incident weight is 51, and the sparsity of this given cut is defined by the ratio of 21 over the minimum of the other two values. And that's greater than one quarter here. This is, a, this is identical to the uh, Shibalik normalized cut? Uh, uh, maybe within a factor of two. It's one of these definitions that uh, okay. we can... Uh, but it has the same numerator in the It has, yes, yes, yeah. yes. So now there's another cut which has a total value of three. Uh, the total weight on the first part is 63, on the second part is 73, and the sparsity here is uh, much smaller, 1 over 21 or something. So the sparsest cut problem is to find the cut with the minimum sparsity in the graph. The conductance of the graph uh, is defined to be the minimum sparsity over all possible cuts in the graph. And uh, one more definition, uh, expanders are the graphs where uh, all cuts have sparsity larger than some constant. Okay, going back to our problem, uh, uh, we can now uh, 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 express the, the sparse cut problem as an optimization uh, of this object objective function over uh, vectors that are zero and one. Uh, well, uh, to optimize this function with discrete vector is an empty hard problem. So what people do is to uh, relax the vector uh, over the reals. And then uh, the solution becomes much easier because uh, the vector x that minimizes this function is uh, the generalized eigenvector of the pair L and D. Oops, sorry. Right, so this is the eigenvector. Uh, now the eigenvector, in order to find the eigenvector, the fastest known algorithm to compute it is actually based on the solver. You have to call the linear system solver. Uh, and what you see here is uh, um, uh, what the, the quality of the segmentation increases by, uh, obviously, uh, they look much closer to uh, what humans will do. Uh, and uh, the algorithm that we ran in order to do that was spectral rounding, which is a variation of uh, 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 finding the vector and then iteratively changing the graph and computing more eigenvectors until the, the graph disconnects. But it's, it's based on uh, the, the, the hard core of the algorithm is uh, the, eigen, uh, the eigenvector computation. That's a good description for spectral rounding. Uh, you mean uh, uh, literature? Uh, there is, a, I think, a Dave Tolliver's thesis okay. and also a paper by uh, Gary Miller and Dave Tolliver. Okay. Uh, um, so um, now for this kind of systems, for SDD uh, systems, uh, there were people that cared even in the 70s because they are very important in scientific computing applications. So they were introduced 
uh, some um, methods known as multigrid methods were introduced in the 70s, uh, and more specifically called geometrically, geometric multigrid, because they solved uh, discretizations of partial differential equations. Uh, the discretizations at different uh, levels of, uh, uh, of detail provide grids which uh, are, uh, start from a fine grid and become coarser. Now, uh, there are provably linear time algorithms for certain PDEs on nice domains. Uh, then, after a geometric multigrid, uh, algebraic multigrid algorithms were introduced, and there were an attempt to generalize the geometric multigrid principles to unstructured graphs. Uh, but there, the selection of the multigrid hierarchy becomes a problem, and it's based on heuristics. Sometimes, uh, the heuristics and the solvers are fast, but sometimes. So there, there are uh, cases where they just fail. So the convergence is unpredictable, and uh, one uh, way people have been trying to uh, cope with that is to have a lot of parameters in the algorithm. So there is a very well implemented and developed uh, AMG solver called Boomer AMG, which has uh, 11 different knobs, and that's a huge space of parameters there. Well, maybe that works for people that have a background in engineering and know how to play with those things. But in general, we can imagine other types of users. So what we try to do in theoretical computer science or in computer science is to deal with very large systems which uh, uh, come com in completely unstructured matrices without any grid structure. We have arbitrary, arbitrary weights in the matrix coefficients. And we want to develop software for applications for non-engineers, for example, doctors. Right? So what we do is to study, study the asymptotic complexity of the problems. Uh, we prefer broad complexity statements over specialized or experimental results. But the hope is that if we do that well and we understand the mathematics and the theory of it, then uh, uh, if we are able to develop, in other words, robust application agnostic solvers, we will eventually get better application-oriented solvers by just applying the, the knowledge we gain uh, in the process. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about the combinatorial multigrid solver. That's a solver based uh, on multigrid literature, but also on uh, theoretical results. It's a, a very fast, uh, theoretically sound solver. It's not always faster than algebraic multigrid, but it's always fast. That's the key. Uh, and there is a software package that's nearing public distribution. We also have optimized parallel code for multi-cores. Um, and we believe that it delivers this black uh, box promise. Uh, people that are not engineers can use it. Uh, we have used it to solve very large, more than 25 million variables uh, systems on 3D matrices that are quite difficult. Actually, these uh, optical coherency tomography retinal images come in 3D volumes uh, with very large variations of the weights. And uh, we also allow uh, high degree nodes, for example. High degree nodes can completely confuse uh, other solvers. And the particular segmentation you see there uh, was obtained by introducing some high degree nodes too. So here's an outline. Uh, well, it has basically two parts. The first part is the mathematics, some theory behind it, uh, which is fun because it's a, it's a theory about comparing graphs. Uh, and then we will uh, see briefly on the second part how the theory applies to the combinatorial multigrid solver. So I'm going to uh, start by measuring, uh, by defining a measure of graph similarity. And uh, that, that will be called the support number, which is just a dry algebraic definition, the maximum over all vectors of this uh, quotient called the Rayleigh quotient. The condition number is going to be the pr product of two support numbers, A by B and B by A. That's very dry and algebraic, but there's always a nice uh, natural meaning. If we see the graph as an electrical network, then uh, the, uh, 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 you know, that V transpose LV term is actually this quadratic form, where uh, we have a sum over the wires, WIJ, 
times vi minus vj squared. That's the power dissipated on that wire. So that V transpose LV is actually the power dissipated by the electrical network. And the condition number is basically a measure of similarity of the energy profile of two electrical networks. That's it. So you're, you're trying to find a setting of voltages where the two matrices, the two networks, would give us large possible difference. Yes, That's but hopefully nice. we'll try to, to find but pairs of matrices where uh, they, have, they have small, uh, about the same profile. So let's look at a very simple example where uh, we have the first graph uh, is a line graph. Uh, the second graph is a cycle graph, just a loop between 1 and n. Uh, if we set the, second, the voltage on the second node to be 1 and 0 everywhere, everywhere else, we get that the support of A by B uh, is greater than 1, meaning that the graph A, uh, 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 the graph B always uh, dissipates more power than A. Now, if we set the voltages to be a linear function, V sub i equals i, then we get that the support of B by A is greater than n over 2, meaning that there is a voltage setting where B dissipates much more, much more power than A. Okay? And this is a bad case. Now, uh, a different example is a line and a graph B where we have two short loops between uh, uh, nodes 1, 3, and 2, and 4. Now, if we look at this wire between 1 and 3, the power dissipated on this wire can actually be bounded in terms of the power dissipated on the path between V1 and V3 on the first graph. Um, um, so that's the path. Uh, uh, we can do the same for the other wire, which is between V2 and V4, and there's another path. And we bound that uh, power dissipation uh, on V2, V4. Now, in a way, we, we just did an embedding of the second graph. We, we look at of, of the second graph into the first. We look at the extra wires of the second graph and just embed them into paths in the first graph. So uh, the dilation of the embedding is two because the length of the paths I used is at most two. Uh, the congestion is three because there is this uh, edge between uh, two and three that was used three times, two times by the paths and one to support uh, the corresponding edge on B. So then the condition number of this embedding is at most the dilation times the congestion. And that's a general uh, technique uh, to finding lower bounds, upper bounds of the condition number. You embed the first graph to the second and you look at the congestion times the dilation product. Now going back to the first example, uh, the best bending here is bad. You have to embed that long edge over a very long path, which has length n. And that's intuitively the reason why the condition number is bad. So there is a correspondence between embeddings and condition number. So when we want to solve systems, there are direct methods. Uh, for example, the Gaussian elimination or the symmetric analog of it, which is the Cholesky factorization. The problem here is when we start eliminating variable, uh, variables, the system becomes dense very quickly. Um, um, still, the best known algorithms for positive definite matrices are based on uh, uh, direct methods. But uh, direct methods currently are good for, say, 2D mat matrices of size about 1 million and 3D matrices of si size about 200K, or size is the number of variables. Uh, which is not uh, what we want because the applications have uh, much, uh, many more variables in the order of millions. So the way to work around the field problem is to use iterative methods uh, which are based only on matrix vector products. For example, the Richardson iteration which produces a new approximation from an old approximation. Uh, or more complicated iterations like the Chebyshev or the conjugate gradient iteration. But now the main problem becomes the speed of convergence. How many iterations we need in order to find the, uh, a good approximation solution? So that depends on the condition number, which is the ratio of the maximum over the minimum eigenvalue of uh, the graph A, or the matrix A, which is bad for most interesting cases. And the workaround, an extra workaround around, uh, around this problem is uh, to uh, precondition the system, change the system by multiplying left and right by a matrix B inverse 
uh, which uh, is called the P-conditioner. Now the iterative method requires the solution of a linear system with B uh, uh, and uh, uh, the speed of uh, uh, convergence now de uh, depends on uh, the condition number of the matrix B inverse A which is also called the condition number of the pair A and B. Now you may uh, have heard about uh, very simple uh, precondition methods, for example, the Jacob iteration or the Gauss ideal operation. Uh, these precondition methods are all based on a matrix driven precondition. So, what people thought was to look at the matrix, take part of, uh, of the matrix, and use it as a precondition. For example, the Jacob iteration uh, is when the precondition is the diagonal, the Gauss ideal iteration is when the precondition is the triangular, upper triangular part. But uh, in the early 90s, when uh, someone in computer science faced the problem of finding an easily invertible precondition for a Laplacian, uh, uh, they came up with a different solution, uh, which was a really paradigm shifting idea. And that was to look at the Laplacian as a graph and use as a preconditioner uh, a tree, a spanning tree of the graph and in particular the maximum spanning tree. That idea was uh, introduced by Praveen Vajia. So, for example, when we have a graph, what is the maximum spanning tree? We just uh, uh, pick the heaviest incident edge for every node, and uh, that forms a forest, and then we just uh, add a few more edges to uh, make the, the tree, the spanning tree. A uh, generalization of this idea is to approximate a given graph with a simpler graph, a little more complicated than a tree, so Vajia's idea was actually to use a spanning tree plus a few edges. Um, so all the, all the known near-optimal uh, complexity theoretical results that I talked about in my second slide uh, basically uh, owe to Vajia's idea, uh, and they are based on, on preconditioning with uh, sparser graphs, uh, on the same vertex set uh, and uh, reweighting of, uh, of of the edges. Uh, but what oh, I'm going to be talking more about that on, on my second talk. Uh, but today I'm going to be talking about a, a, a different kind of combinatorial preconditioning that actually gives uh, uh, much better preconditioning uh, preconditioners. Uh, um, so uh, on the left I have uh, Vazia's idea, uh, which is a spanning tree of the graph. Uh, on the right, I have Steiner trees, uh, an idea due to Greban, Keith Greban and Gary Miller. So in this case, we make a tree where the leaves correspond to the nodes in the original graph. And we make extra nodes, which are called the Steiner nodes, or the red nodes in this case. So the preconditioner uh, in this case, as you see, has a bigger size than the original graph. So the question is, does it even make sense to use a larger preconditioner or higher dimension preconditioner? The usual kind of preconditioners involve solutions of the system B y equals z, where B has the same dimension as A. What we can do to use uh, the Steiner tree preconditioners is to set up a larger system where we augment the z part by zeros, and we just solve with Laplacian of, uh, of uh, the tree, and we recover the solution from here, from the uh, corresponding part of the uh, vector of the unknowns. Now, it can be shown that this operator is actually a linear operator. It, there is a matrix corresponding to it, and it's actually a Laplacian that corresponds to it, and the graph is called the sur complement of uh, uh, the elimination, uh, the sur complement of T of the, tree, of the tree with respect to the elimination of the internal nodes. Uh, you don't need to worry about that. The thing to remember is that there is uh, an effective preconditioner B happening here when we do this kind of operator, operation. Uh, in order to be able to study the condition number, we want to uh, be able to look at things like X transpose BX, where B is the effective preconditioner. And what is that? So we have this Steiner tree. We set up uh, the voltages. Uh, to the values indicated by the vector x on the leaves, and then we let the current flow in the electrical network, uh, and that uh, assigns some voltage values to the internal nodes. 
the voltages there uh, is a vector y that actually minimize the power dissipation in the whole network. Um, so x transpose bx then is the power dissipation on this uh, uh, larger network where y, uh, the, the, the vector y minimizes the power dissipation. So it's just another uh, power dissipation thing then in, in a larger network. Sorry, the, the b here, mm -hmm. normally the original graph is denoted with an A matrix. Is the B here different? It's a preconditioner, or is it this, did you really mean the original graph? Uh, B is the effective preconditioner. It's the effective preconditioner. Uh, so the, the, we, we never explicitly use it or form it. Okay. We use just the tree, but it corresponds, uh, the, the operation we do corresponds to that effective preconditioner. Okay. I see, right. So what would mm -hmm. be the inner product with respect to that? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so then we can just start looking at a very special cases of preconditioning uh, with uh, Steiner graphs. And the simplest of all cases is to precondition any arbitrary graph on the left by uh, a Steiner graph which has only one Steiner node and it's just a star node, a star graph. So uh, we look at the yij on the left and we want to uh, bound the power dissipation of this wire and there is only one path that can be used to support that edge. And that's the length two path uh, we thread on the star graph. Uh, so the dilation of the embedding is two. Now, we have to give to that red path enough capacity to support the capacity of phi and j. And we have to do that for all edges of the graph on the left. And that actually forces us to pick weights for the leaves of the star graph, wi, where wi uh, is the total incident weight uh, of node i on the left. And that bounds the support of the graph A by the graph B. Sir, is there some reason the nodes L and N don't appear on the left side of your little picture? No, no, no. Uh, you imagine all, all, the, okay. all, all the nodes are there. Uh, I just did one particular edge okay. to, to, to see how uh, it gets bounded in the start graph. Okay. So now, on the other direction, we want to bound the support of B by A. And the way we do it is uh, the following. The effective preconditioner here can be uh, computed explicit explicitly. It is a graph, as I said. Uh, and uh, weights of the graph, uh, B, I, J, are given by the products W, I times W, J divided by the sum of the W, I's. So, yep. I'm sorry. Okay. So uh, then we, uh, we uh, have this new graph, and we want to take the minimum over all the vectors x of this Rayleigh quotient x transpose bx over x transpose ax. And you can expand this out algebraically and get uh, a factor of uh, a product of three factors. So the first product is uh, the Rayleigh quotient of b by its diagonal, the Laplacian of b and its diagonal. And this is always a constant. Uh, and the reason is that uh, this graph B is an expander. It doesn't have sparse cats. Uh, and there is the chicken equality that says that uh, graph, uh, if a graph is an expander, then it has uh, uh, constant eigenvalues. Uh, then the second term, the second factor here, is B over A, the total degrees in graph B over the total degrees in graph A. And since we know explicitly the graph B, uh, we know also the total weights. And this happens to be also a constant, at most two. Okay. Now, the third factor is uh, the Rayleigh quotient of the diagonal of A by A. And here again is uh, where Chigian inequality is used. If we want the total support of B by A to be a constant, we want the third factor to be a constant. And that means, by the Chigian inequality, uh, uh, that uh, actually the graph must be an expander. You have to have constant eigenvectors for your graph, uh, constant eigenvalues for your graph B. That means forces you to have a graph which is an expander. So uh, your preconditioner, your star preconditioner, is a good preconditioner only if your graph is an expander. Uh, so we have those two conditions: uh, the, the graph must be an expander, and the weights in the star. Uh, should not be much larger than the weights in the graph A. I'm going to allow only one exceptional vertex 
if uh, there is a vertex in the first graph uh, whose total weight uh, dominates the rest of the weights, uh, then the weight Wn in the star can be arbitrarily large. But that's just a detail. So now we can move to more general uh, Steiner graphs. Uh, what we do is we find a number of clusters in the first graph. And we assign a Steiner star to each cluster. One red node per cluster and one Steiner star per cluster. And uh, from that, we create a quotient graph, Q, which is a graph on the red nodes. We just join the red nodes. So we make this new graph by the stars and the connections between their roots. Uh, and here we need to bound the support of A by B. Or, sorry, B by A. So, um, no, no, the, um, uh, the support of A by B. Right. So if we look then at an edge between uh, the two clusters in the original graph, there is only one path to support. That's, that's length 3 here. Okay. And also, we have to give this path enough capacity in order to support uh, the weight of the edge in the original graph in order to have a congestion which is small. So if there is a total weight equal uh, of C uh, crossing the two, uh, between the two clusters in the original graph, the corresponding edge on the quotient graph must have a weight equal to C in order to get a dilation which is small and a congestion which is small. And that bounds the support of A by B, uh, upper bounds it by 3. So now in the other direction, we have B and A. And uh, we can sort of give, again, a proof uh, by picture. Uh, instead of looking at the pair B by A, uh, we can actually form a new graph, which is B1, B plus A. Uh, and use the simple identity that the power dissipation uh, in, uh, in B1 is just a little more uh, comparing to uh, B. Uh, so the support of B1 by A is the support of B by A plus 1. So we change our problems to B1 and A, a new pair. And then since we have these embedding properties from the previous slide, uh, we know that B1 is actually uh, very close to a graph B2 without the quotient edges. So the, 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 the graph B2 without the quotient edges dissipates power at most uh, sorry, the, the graph B1 dissipates power at most three times that of B2. So we change again our analysis to a different pair, which is B2 and A. Right? Um, well, now all edges going between clusters in B2 and A can, support, can be supported one by one. So we can just get rid of those and look at a new problem, which is B prime, a batch of stars, and A prime. And that becomes our final problem in, in this procedure in progress through equivalent or roughly equivalent uh, inequalities. And now we know from the base case that each cluster uh, must be an expander uh, in, 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 uh, in the graph A. And the star edges uh, must be roughly equal to the total incident weights in the underlying clusters. Uh, but they also must be large enough to support the embedding of the intercluster edges. So this is a precondition property. Uh, we, we have to have clusters such that a constant fraction of the weight for each vertex in the cluster must stay within its assigned cluster. Two properties, expansion for each cluster and also a relative isolation from the exterior. And that gives the requirements for our clustering. And again, we can allow one exceptional heaviest vertex per cluster. So um, I'm going to show you then how to compute these clusterings that give you the, the good preconditioning. Uh, before that, I'm going to define the weighted degree of a vertex, which is going to be the sum of the weights uh, uh, incident to the vertex divided by the maximum degree. For example, in this simple case, uh, the weighted degree is the sum of all these numbers divided by 20, which is the maximum, so it's 2. The combinatorial degree is 4, but the weighted degree is, is, is smaller. And now here's the algorithm for decomposing uh, a graph into good clusters. We just form a graph F by picking the heaviest incident edge, edge for each vertex in the vertex set. And that's also the first step that the maximum, maximum weight spanning tree generation algorithm does. 
I claim that this graph is going to be a forest. Uh, say uh, it's not. We we'll prove it by contradiction. Then we must have uh, this set of inequalities, uh, W2 greater than W1, W3 greater than W2, and so on. And that gives you a contradiction. So the graph F is then a forest. And you can also easily say that there are no vertex, uh, vertices that are singletons. Now, for each vertex which has a weighted degree greater than a threshold t, uh, which we can pick, uh, say 4 or 8, something like that, we cut the edge that leaves that vertex in the forest. And that further decomposes uh, the forest uh, into smaller trees. Then uh, we can just split the remaining trees arbitrarily into cost and size clusters. And that gives us the clustering. A very, very simple procedure. So now each constant size cluster uh, has a constant conductance in the forest, in the tree. And there is at most one exceptional vertex without this precondition property, meaning that the edge leaving is heavier than the edge staying inside the cluster. Now, uh, that happens uh, with the tree. If you go back and add the original, uh, the original edges in the original graph that we threw out in the first step, uh, that makes the conductance at least uh, 1 over t, where t is the threshold. So we have uh, 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 clustering whose quality depends on the threshold t. But uh, whenever uh, there are many vertices with a weighted degree greater than this threshold, uh, this gives uh, a good clustering. So just a simple illustration by a small example. The algorithm is very simple. Right? So we have this graph, and every node picks the heaviest neighbor. Right? Very simple. Linear and just one or two passes of the matrix. Then we make a star for every cluster. Say for uh, the first cluster, for the first three, uh, the total incident weight at, at node V1 is 22. So we make uh, a weight of 22 in the star. Uh, we do that for all uh, edges in the first star. And we make a second star for the second cluster. And that gives us a collection of stars, corresponding clusters. And then we make the quotient edges, forming uh, a, a, a graph on, uh, with the red nodes. Now, the total weight between the two red nodes here is 4, which corresponds to the total cut uh, between the two clusters, 4, right? And uh, the basic observation here is the preconditioner preserves the sparse cuts, has a tendency to preserve the sparse cuts in the graph, putting them in the quotient, and aggregating the expanders. So that's the main idea. So now, um, a few more words about Steiner preconditioners. Uh, subgraph preconditioners, introduced by Vaidzi, are good enough to, to get theory to work. And, and prove nice asymptotic theoretical results. But Steiner preconditioners give much better constants. Uh, one reason to, uh, that happens um, uh, uh, is the following. Say we have a two-dimensional, uh, d-dimensional regular mesh, say a square grid. The best tree for a square grid has condition number n. The best Steiner tree has condition number square root of n. Okay. So that extends to Steiner graphs and subgraph preconditioners in general. Uh, and that's the reason uh, constants are much better, which in practice makes a, makes a big difference. So now in the last uh, few slides, I'm going to roughly describe how the preconditioners uh, uh, pr uh, give uh, rise to the combinatorial multigrade solver. So what happens in multigrid solver is, uh, is we apply first a very easy uh, iteration, like Richardson iteration, which is called the smoother. Now, if you can plot the, your error uh, in the finest grid or graph. And locally, the, the, the error is very wild. Uh, there is no correlation between the error at a node and, and the neighbors. But after a few, a few steps of the smoother, you get a nice smooth error locally. And then the idea is, well, OK, we have a smooth error. Maybe we can make a coarser graph, project that error into uh, the coarser graph, solve there recursively, 
And then when we are done, just project back to the, to the final grid and solve this problem. Um, um, so algebraically, uh, what happens uh, is we have an a, a n times n projection operator that goes between the fine and the coarse grid. The coarse grid can be described uh, uh, by the Kalerki condition, which sets the quotient or the, the, the coarse grid to be equal to R transpose AR. Uh, we have a basic iterative method uh, called the smoother. Those are the three ingredients. And then we have just an iteration which gets applied to uh, the previous error from the previous iteration and produces a new, iter uh, a new error. Uh, the metric says here is the smoother, so you basically first trans uh, transform the error by the smoother, and then you apply this blue matrix in the middle, which happens to be a projection operator. Uh, that means that completely annihilates uh, the components of the error that lie in the range of this matrix R, roughly. So it completely kills uh, those components. So the smoother kills the high frequency components. The middle blue matrix kills the low frequency components, uh, uh, or, or the, the components in the range of, of this matrix R. So what then, you, what, what is needed that to, to get this to work is to uh, have a, a good angle, angle between the low frequencies of the smoother, which are left intact from the smoother operation, and the rates of R, meaning that the first the smoother gets rid of the high frequency components. What's left should be mostly in the range of R, so that the second matrix can kill it. So that's that's the, the, the main idea. So going back to our Steiner preconditioners, uh, rec recall that we compute a Steiner graph S, uh, and uh, we let uh, R to be uh, a matrix that indicates the clusters. In other words, uh, Rij is 1 if vertex i is in cluster J, and 0 otherwise. Okay. Now, we can show algebraically that the quotient uh, we constructed combinatorially is actually what uh, the Galerkin condition requires for uh, multigrid. The quotient is R transpose AR. And recall that in the preconditioning algorithm, we set up this larger system with a Steiner uh, graph, and we recover the solution Y. Now, it can be shown algebraically that Y is described by this formula. So the inverse of the effective preconditioner then is this matrix that you see at the bottom. Um, well, we're almost done. We have a relationship between, uh, for the condition number between A and B. We know it's constant. So that extends very easily to the condition number of the normalized A and the normalized B, where we normalize by the diagonal of A, uh, square root of that. So now, the condition number means that the low frequencies of the normalized A and the low frequencies of the normalized B are close. So those two things are very similar, so their eigenvectors are similar as well. Now the low frequency of the normalized B is the range of D to the one half times the restriction matrix R. And basically that's the angle that we want to bound in order to prove that multigrid works. So the main point then uh, uh, is that the condition number analysis for the preconditioners give sufficient and necessary conditions for the choice of the coarse grid. And from that, the uh, two-level uh, uh, proof follows, that the two-level uh, scheme works. Uh, now, there's a, a larger volume of theory of support trees that gives insights and proofs for the full multi-level behavior. Uh, I think, for some reason, uh, two slides go where again there anyway. So uh, comparing now the, the combinatorial multigrid solver and the algebraic multigrid solver, uh, the uh, time, the sequential time to construct the hierarchy in combinatorial multigrid is smaller, uh, and there is a very straightforward parallelization. Uh, well, a quote from a multigrid algebraic multigrid paper: the process of coarse grid selection is fundamentally sequential in nature. And that gives you an impression uh, about the, the differences uh, uh, in the 
in the hierarchy construction. Now, uh, it's easy to fool the coarsening heuristics of uh, algebraic multigrid, say with a few high degree nodes, uh, to force it to have bad convergence. And this actually happens in real applications and in real problems we have easily solved with combinatorial multigrid. So we believe that uh, we, are, we are always fast, not always faster than AMG, but that's the key. Uh, we have proofs, and it's a black box. And now, uh, one more slide. Uh, experiments comparing uh, the combinatorial multigrid or the Steiner preconditioners uh, with the subgraph preconditioners. As I told you, the constants are different. Uh, the Steiner preconditioner construction is much faster. Uh, and also, uh, the speed of convergence measured by the residual error at the iteration case faster. Now the blue curve here is Stein, uh, Steiner preconditioner. The red curve is a subgraph preconditioner. As you can see, it's much steeper, the blue one, meaning that it converges much faster. Now, conclusions. Uh, combinatorial preconditioning studies graph similarity with respect to the condition number, which is an algebraically defined measure. It's algebraically motivated. Uh, but it's naturally related to graph decomposition uh, in expanders that are relatively isolated for their exteriors, their exterior, right? So there is a, a very nice correspondence between condition number and graph theoretic properties. Uh, combinatorial preconditions have been used to design nearly optimal symmetric diagonal dominant solvers, uh, and this very fast uh, combinatorial multigrid method uh, that. Uh, we implemented them, we will soon make available to the public. And that's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we have lots of time for questions. And the uh, About five standards minutes. do you have typically in a problem like the square root of n? Is it, you know, like this, how many Steiner nodes? Yeah. Um, usually, the problems we're working with, we get um, a reduction of the number of nodes uh, by a factor of four, sometimes bigger. Uh, so uh, in the second, uh, very, right, in order to, to get a, yes, the average size is four. Uh, in order to get a good condition number, you cannot really have uh, much larger clusters unless your graph contains very large expanders because each cluster has, has to be an expander. But typically, with the problems uh, that uh, we have been looking so far, uh, we get four, five, sometimes eight. But so you, uh, if you go back to the construction of the graph, which showed the the, the Steiner yeah. construction for that simple Laplacian, you've mm -hmm. got the two connected clusters, right? Mm -hmm. um, that was a case where things just naturally clustered into two because of some very strong nodes, right? It's a very strong connection. So there was a natural yes. two-way partition. Yes. If you have something that's close to a uniform Laplacian you know, mm -hmm. kind of problem, mm -hmm. then you don't get a lot of these disconnected things. You have to do that. You know, you said there's a second part, which is break F up into constant-sized pieces. Yes. Right? Yes. There must be some knobs hidden in there where you say constant-sized pieces, right? Like this number four you pull out must depend on some knob where you say, well... Yes, what? yes. Um, the, 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 the key is that the, the, it doesn't really depend on the node. We can just pick four, right? And it's going to work. Now, uh, if we have a particular application, it may be a little better to pick eight than four. Uh -huh. uh, and that's up to uh, the application-oriented develop, development of the code. Uh, right, but you, you were saying mm -hmm. that AFG has too many knobs, and yet your technique, if you want to work mm -hmm. well in practice, mm -hmm. Has knobs, right? It's not no. knob free. Only the theoretical right. convergence is mm -hmm. knob free. But if you want to work well, if you care about you know factors of two, that there are knobs, right? Uh, AMZ, I've I've worked with AMZ solvers uh, where uh, they actually don't converge. No. Uh, so uh, there is a uh, difference. Uh, there are cases where AMZ doesn't converge or converges very very slow, uh, and the knobs are at a different level. Uh, there you, you can pick a different coarsening heuristic, mm -hmm. completely different. Uh, not just something uh, uh, in, say, in the size of the clusters. Right. Or you pick a different smoother. Okay. Uh, we fix the smoother, uh, the, and, and there, there are sufficient necessary conditions. Mm -hmm. And then there you can just play a little bit in the end with... Uh, with and your, uh, your smoother is the Richardson with a fixed omega? Uh, the smoother uh, comes out to be uh, Jacobi iteration uh, uh, with... Um, the diagonal, meaning the uh, i minus d inverse times a, okay. uh, may be divided by 2. 
uh, but. Now, have you considered, you know, this is a very elegant framework, mm -hmm. beautiful work, uh, but it's, it's based on the Steiner concept of having a local star, a mm -hmm. bunch of things, introducing a supernode, yes. which will sort of be the average. Yes. Have you considered variants where you pick one node and then the others don't have to? In other words, where the R matrix doesn't consist completely of ones and zeros? Uh, there is a basic, basic distinction uh, between uh, matrices where the ones and zeros are, uh, the ones are uh, disjoint, mm -hmm. uh, and then there are matrices where the ones or the non zero entries overlap. Right. Right. Um, so um, I have done some experiments with overlapping uh -huh. uh, operators. Uh, they weren't uh, as fast. They, they produced some faster convergence, uh, meaning the number of iteration, iterations was smaller, okay. but the actual time to, to do the operation was a bit larger. Hmm. So the total came out to be a little slower. Is it just because the R is not sparse, so there's more, multi more operations in the multiplication with R? Yes, yes. and uh, it's a very, very easy aggregating operation, or averaging or summing up, so you yes. don't have to do any multiplication. The sum involved there, the multiplication is extremely easy, right? It's yes, just a matter yes, of yes. adding sub blocks of matrices. Yes, yes. The other one involves continuous, you know, floating point operations. Right. Like so it's, it's uh, that, that uh, step makes a difference there. Although the computing the <coughs> uh, the course of matrices, mm -hmm. or the, the, the subgraphs, or whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. right? That's a one time setup. So typically, how many iteration sweeps do you run through this thing? Um, um, you mean. Uh, Iterations at the top level, yeah. or I guess that that's mm -hmm. more related to this question of W's and generalized yes. W's, which you didn't address in this talk, right? I did not. No. Right. So, um, right, uh, every every level basically multiplied calls uh, uh, the smaller level a number of times, and right. if it calls it one time, then it's called the V cycle. Uh, two times called the W cycle, but we do uh, we maximize the number uh, of uh, calls to the to the next level. Uh, targeting uh, still linear work, total linear work. And how many iterations of smoothing do you typically use? Just one. Just one? Yes. yes. Okay. yes. Um, so the, uh, there are two parts to the overall solver. One mm -hmm. is picking, making this classification, and then yes. the second is the actual V cycle or yes. V cycle. Yes. yes. If you fix the classification to say red, black, or something, does that break everything? Individual of this adaptive. Uh, um, so yes. So, so let's say you just pick mm -hmm. the course nodes to be a fixed grid pattern. Yes. So there are other uh, multigrid solvers in the hierarchy. Uh, sorry, in the literature that want to do exactly that: keep the matrix the same, this, uh, keep the grid throughout uh, the hierarchy. Uh, for example, in order to be able to use it with uh, GPUs. Uh, but uh, you can uh, show that that's impossible. In order to, uh, to, to get a good condition number between every two levels, you have to contract, make the classes in different ways. N not picking one node doesn't work necessarily. So in practice, in some applications, it, it, it may be the best thing to do, uh, but uh, it doesn't work always. And we, we've encountered problems where other uh, multigrid solvers break for that reason. It just converts very slowly. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thanks again. Thank you.